All right, so that's the molecular mechanism by which proteins or amino acids can stimulate mTOR, and it's specifically leucine-rich proteins, and that's why we focus on leucine-rich protein when we're talking about the diet. To confirm that this has a positive effect, this is work from Naomi Cermak, who is a wonderful young scientist who unfortunately passed away young, far too young. But what she did is she did a meta-analysis. And what her meta-analysis was, was it looked at both trained and untrained. She looked at young and old. She looked at a bunch of different studies that had a huge amount of, of subjects in them. And what you can see is what you do is you take this triangle at the end, and that's what tells us whether your intervention has a positive effect, a negative effect, or no effect. So if this line crosses zero, then it has no effect. If it's on this side, that means it has a negative effect. If it's on this side, it has a positive effect. And what you can see is that if you take in protein together with your resistance exercise, whether you're untrained or trained, you actually see a beneficial effect of about one kilo of muscle mass, greater increase in mass um, over a period of about 12 weeks. Uh, eight to 12 weeks. Okay, so, so you're going to add about two point, a little bit more than two pounds based on whether you've taken in protein together with your, with your um, resistance exercise. So again, it pays to take in the protein. So that's the first question. Then the second question is how much protein? And so this is a study by Dan Moore um, out of Stu Phillips group where he fed people egg protein and he looked to see how much muscle protein synthesis after resistance exercise increased based on how, whether they took egg protein or not. So this is with no egg protein, with a small, moderate, or a, a decent amount of protein. And then this is with, a, with twice that. So it's basically 40 grams of protein. And so what you can see is that there's an almost linear increase in protein synthesis as you go from, about, from no protein up to... 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight, or about 20 grams of protein. And then from 20 grams to 40 grams, there's not really a big increase. And again, this is why most of the protein bars that you see, or most of the proteins or foods, will talk about the presence of 20 grams of protein. Because if you do the math, 0.25 grams, multiply that by 75 kilos, which is the average weight, or the weight of an average American, what you get is you get 20 grams. And so this data was the data that basically shaped the food industry to say, oh, our goal is to get 20 grams of protein into the body. Okay, so now 20 grams of protein, but does it matter where your protein comes from? And the answer is absolutely yes. If you take in casein and whey, that's your curds and whey, that's your old um, Little Miss Muffet. Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, eating her curds and whey. The curds are your casein. That's when you put in an acid into your milk. Those are the proteins that clump in the acid. And the whey proteins are acid soluble. So many of you um, will spend lots and lots of money on your whey protein. And then if you ever get yogurt, you eat the yogurt out of the container. You come back the next day, you see the liquid in there. A lot of you are like, ew, that's gross, and you pour it into the sink. Well, what you poured into the sink is what you then went and spent a whole lot of money on because the whey protein, when you take your spoon, you put it into your mouth, you put it back in, your mouth is somewhat acidic. That acidity causes the whey-soluble protein from the milk to come out and to be released. And so that is your whey. It's the soluble in acid. Casein is the clumped in acid. So when you, when you eat these and you go into your stomach, your casein is going to form a clump and it's going to release the protein slowly. The whey protein is going to be acid soluble. So in the acid environment of your stomach, it's going to just flow right into your body. So the result is that you would expect to see more leucine and amino acids released with whey than casein. And the result is that you get this, this difference here. And you can see the effect of resistance exercise and the effect of just at-rest feeding. There's the at-rest feeding effect, and then there's a doubling more of it with resistance exercise. Again, because now you know the molecular mechanism, the two things are additive. Interestingly, soy is in the middle. So it, it is kind of right in between the casein and whey. And if you look at it, the reason that soy is in the middle is when we look at the leucine content of the soy, the leucine content is moderate compared to the whey protein. So the soy protein has much less leucine 
that's liberated into the blood. You can see the casein has very little that's released. That's because, again, these, these formed um, clumps in your stomach so that they're not actually being digested. So, so the soy protein, if you just take soy protein, you add whey protein, or you add a little bit of leucine to it, you get, um, you get a nice increase in leucine that results in the same amount of protein synthesis as you would get from whey protein. Again, so the leucine component of the protein is very important to how, how, well, the work, how well the protein works to increase protein synthesis in your muscle. All right. So then does it matter how frequently we eat is the next question that you should be asking. So this is a beautiful study done out of John Hawley's lab by Jose Areta, who's now in, at the Norwegian Institute of Sport. And what they did is they assumed that maybe you're intermittent fasting, maybe you're just a, a, a professional athlete who doesn't like to get up in the morning and eat breakfast. So can you just eat twice as much um, at, at half the frequency? So what they did is they did 40 grams twice uh, every six hours, or they had a different group eating 20 grams every three hours, or they had your basically this, think of the pulse group as your teenage boys who basically eat constantly. So they're eating 10 grams of protein, but it's every one and a half hours. Everybody gets the same amount of protein. And then what they do is they measure muscle protein synthesis. And what you can see is the bolus, the ones who eat the least frequently are going to have the least amount of protein synthesis. The ones who do this 20 grams every three hours, they actually see a significantly greater increase in muscle protein synthesis than the ones who ate every six hours, even though it's the exact same amount of protein, largely because the, as Dan Moore's study showed, you can only handle about 20 grams of protein if you're a 75 kilo person. Um, and so the result is if you eat more than that, you don't actually use it to build muscle. And when you eat small amounts throughout the day, you actually don't see the same increase again because you're not getting the peak of leucine. You're not getting all of these same mechanisms in place. So again, what we're looking at is we're going to talk about these four feedings a day of 20 grams per feeding. So if we were to try and do this and we were trying to eat for peak muscle growth, not necessarily peak strength, but peak muscle growth, what we would do, and this is for a professional team that we were working with, is the idea is you get them up, you feed um, a meal with 20.25 grams per kilogram body weight of protein, and you do that every four hours. And so you see that one, two, three, four, and then a late night snack um, that has about 0.5 grams per kilogram body weight of protein. And so the reason that we use more is because now you've going on your longest fasting period and we probably use a different type here as well and I'll explain that in a second. So then what you would do is you would put your practice somewhere in here. You would eat before your after your practice and then you see that the increase in protein synthesis, the green um, arcs here, it's a little bit more because you just had a practice, you were running around so your legs are going to or you're going to do whatever your activity is. Now that meal that you eat, you're gonna get a bigger effect on protein synthesis. And then what we do is we do our strength training right before we eat our dinner because our dinner, for most people, is the most protein-rich meal of the day. We still are only looking for 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight of protein, but because we've done strength training, we see an even greater increase in protein synthesis. And if we were to do a, a late night snack with even more protein in it, now we're gonna be able to maintain that high protein for as long as we can overnight before we pick it up the next day. Okay, so, so we're looking at this leucine-rich protein, 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight per meal. If you do a full body strength training program, you're gonna increase the 0.25 to 0.4 grams per kilogram body weight. And if you are an older person, if you're an older person, you're gonna actually start increasing the amount of protein that you have at each of those meals because as I, as I discussed earlier, older people are less sensitive to the amino acid content of the meal. All right, so in summary, we talk about this idea of proper nutrition for muscle growth. What that means is you need to, in the fasted state, you increase synthesis, but uh, degradation goes up more. And the result is that even though you're increasing your income, you're paying out, you're buying too many things, you're going to go into bankruptcy. And the same thing is happening with your muscle. You're increasing synthesis, but your breakdown is, is too high and you're going to start losing muscle mass. 
Specifically, the amino acids like leucine, the essential amino acids are going to be important for muscle protein synthesis. The increase in synthesis is because you're activating mTOR complex one in a different way than was done by either resistance exercise or growth factors. So when I do resistance exercise, now what I'm doing is I'm moving TSC2 away from REB. Totally different than what we do with amino acids, which is now what I'm doing is I'm moving RAG proteins, specifically the RAG AB proteins, and I'm turning them into a GTP loaded um, protein that can bind to Raptor. So, and then what I'm doing is I'm turning on VPS34 to, to vacuum up all of the mTOR within the, within the cell. And now what I've done is I've turned on REB through the resistance exercise. I've turned on the RAB protein and I've moved mTOR together with the active REB. And now I get twice the stimulus as either one alone. Because if I only do the amino acids and I don't do any resistance exercise, there's not too much active REB. But if I do the resistance exercise, now REB activity is high for a while. Leucine stimulates mTOR complex 1 by binding to cestrin 1, 2, or 3. And then what that does is that, um, is that block that moves away from Gator 2, and it turns Gator 2 on. And Gator 2 is an inhibitor of the GAP protein, Gator 1. So the GAP protein for RAG-AB is completely turned off because Gator 2 sequesters it. And because of that, now the regulator can pop the GDP out so that RAG-AB can be GTP loaded. And again, just like what we talked about, since amino acids and resistance exercise activate mTOR in different ways, the two things are additive, resulting in more muscle growth than either one alone. All right? So there's a little bit of a molecular basis for why people are pushing a lot of protein. Again, the timing doesn't necessarily have to be really close to the exercise. We just want to increase the protein in the overall diet.